Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Maharashtra Rukshya Samvardhini, today, I welcome you all to today's Philately Lecture Series event. Today, we are really fortunate to have Professor Indranil Das, a renowned naturalist and philatelist among us. Dr. Das did his graduation from University of Calcutta, MSc in Limnology from University of Bhopal, and DPhil in Zoology from University of Oxford, UK. His uh, uh, current research interests are systematic zoology, community ecology, conservation biology, biogeography, history of natural history, and paleontology. He is consultant and project holder for Worldwide Fund for Nature, World Conservation Union, that is IUCN, Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, Center for Marine Conservation, Conservation International, Darwin Initiative for Conservation of Species, Fauna and Flora International, Ministry of Higher Education, Government of Malaysia, National Geographic Society, People's Trust for Endangered Species, Ramsar Center, Japan, uh, World Nature, Nature Association, University Brunei, University Malaysia, Sarawak, United Nations Development Program, Global Environmental Facility, and so many other programs he is associated. He is a Fulbright Fellow from Harvard University. Presently, he is Professor at University of Sarawak in Malaysia. He is National Geograph Geographic Explorer. Uh, now, about philately part, he is a very renowned philatelist, participated in many national and international philatelic exhibitions and backed several medals. He is Guinness World Record Holder 2018 for his world's large collection of stamps featuring amphibians. With this short introduction, now I request Professor Indranil Das to deliver his talk on amphibians on stamps of the world. Professor Das. Thank you, um, dear Ajit, for a very generous introduction. And uh, thank you, MVS, as a society, for hosting this talk. And all of you who probably have better things to do on a Saturday evening, but have tuned in, showing your um, interest in nature and in stamps. I think these are the two best things in the world. So those who are involved in nature are, of course, happy, healthy, and those who do philately can never be bored. Um, so uh, I will uh, kind of briefly describe the world of amphibians as captured by stamps of the world that uh, I have in my collection. And I hope this talk will encourage others to get interested in nature through the uh, eyes of stamps and get interested in stamps through nature. So uh, primarily, we would use uh, philately as a tool for education. We would hopefully make people interested in the beauty of nature as uh, depicted in stamps. So my talk would be approximately maybe 40 uh, minutes. Uh, it's a PowerPoint talk. And maybe thereafter, we can have some questions if there are any. I'll try to share screen. Yeah. Can, can you see something? Yeah, yeah. Now full screen, then OK. Yeah, yeah yes, yes. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Ajit. Um, thank you again for inviting me uh, to share my interest in uh, herpetology, uh, so a part of zoology dealing with amphibians and reptiles. And of course, um, the more stamps on reptiles, that'll be another day perhaps. But uh, in this talk, I'd like to talk about amphibians as uh, depicted on posted stamps of the world. This poster was uh, created by uh, the organizers of this talk, MVS, based on our images of both frogs and of stamps. And I, I, I am a staff of uh, the Institute of Biodiversity and Environmental Conservation in University of Malaysia, Sarawak. We do research and teaching in uh, the fields of ecology, evolution, and conservation. So, um, 
Yesterday actually was Save the Frogs Day and it's timely. Uh, we actually targeted it to coincide with this event. Um, it's a day before in the US, um, so kind of uh, day after in the US, so uh, kind of still relevant, but actually we can celebrate Save the Frogs Day any day of the year. Huh? We can um, do activities that promote amphibians and the beauty, the diversity and the conservation pretty much uh, year round. Huh? So here in uh, UNIMAS, our university, we organize the International Bornean Frog Racer uh, photographic competition. This year it's on the 17th of June and uh, it involves um, different kinds of activities, talks, workshops, and, and the main event is the photography competition um, and attracts um, participants from all over the world um, to, to, to our city of coaching in Sarawak in um, East Malaysia. So that's the background. And today's talk, I'll talk about all these different topics uh, of the origins and evolution of amphibians and their diversity. What are the different living groups of amphibians, how their biology has been depicted in stamps, uh, as well as their um, adaptations, um, both as uh, predators and prey. And why are amphibians important for us? How they have inspired uh, scientists from the Victorian uh, or even before that period to now. You may be surprised to know that 5% uh, of all Nobel laureates um, have won the award. They have worked on amphibians. And uh, amphibians are also important to humans as uh, symbolism, as motif, as folklore, as saying. So many of these are also captured in stamps of the world. And finally, how are these animals important as uh, surrogates for conservation of environmental protection? Very often they have been used as the motif and not surprisingly, because amphibians use both land and water. So for them to exist, we need a clean environment, both clean water and clean land. And then I end with um, trivia on stamps uh, depicting amphibians. Uh, what are the remarkable stamps uh, dealing with amphibians? So this is the uh, broad structure of what I'm going to talk about. And uh, feel free to ask me questions uh, afterwards, or I, I'll give you my email at the end. Please uh, drop me an email and I will try to respond to your questions if you have any. So uh, you may be surprised, you think frogs and stamps, uh, how many countries could have shown uh, amphibians on stamps. Huh? I started collecting, as I will tell you later, uh, from a pretty young age, uh, from my school days. And today I see more than 200 countries and postal authorities um, have issued stamps featuring amphibians, the clearly amphibians, huh? recognizable. Uh, may not be two species, but you know they are amphibians. Huh? So many of these countries probably are unknown to many of us, and some are not countries that exist or are uh, postal authorities like in the United Nations. They have three offices in New York, Vienna, and Geneva. They uh, keep on issuing stamps on nature. We know they have an endangered species series, and uh, they have each of these have had um, amphibians on the stamps. So these, this is quite an interesting list huh? showing how important amphibians are to humans worldwide. Huh? Um, there are uh, countries here which have no amphibians and they have featured um, stamps with amphibians. So very, very strange. One is Greenland, I think I may have, did, did I miss? Yeah, it's here. Greenland has no living amphibians, but has featured a fossil amphibian in a stamp. And other countries like in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait have hardly one or two species of amphibians, very few frogs. 
and yet on the stamps they have de depicted uh, uh, them and uh, as for um, certain very rich by diverse uh, countries like india or even brazil um, amphibians feature very poorly amphibians didn't have brazil didn't have any amphibians till 2 years ago and india has produced a few stamps i'll show them later but doesn't do justice to the rich amphibian fauna that we have. Uh, so uh, with these, uh, we move to the main uh, story that I have for you tonight. Um, let's, st every story starts with the beginning of amphibians. And here I start with how amphibians as a group evolved uh, from fish-like ancestors. And one of the first amphibians, Amphibian like fish to be depicted on a stamp is from the Devonian um, around um, close to about 400 million years before present. Paleontologists uh, are familiar with these terms more than zoologists. Uh, Devonian is a period when water resources were drying up and land became available to animals that were brave enough or had adaptations to come on land. In such a scenario, in the Devonian of Canada was a very strange fish, Eusthenopteron fordi. Uh, it was a fish, all right, but it had uh, the first signs of uh, the bones of the forearm. And uh, scientists have recently found the first bone marrow, uh, which probably um, was the precursor, the evolution of the forelimb. So Eusthenopteran uh, uh, was the first known uh, animal with bone marrow, which we know is the site for the creation of a white blood cell for uh, regeneration of blood. And the bones themselves led to the evolution of the forearm um, to be uh, then shown by uh, uh, subsequent amphibians and one famous one I'll, I'll show later, but also amongst uh, early amphibians of uh, both the latter part of the Devonian and also the Carboniferous uh, after that period when there were more animals on land was this famous early amphibian Ichthyostega and several species uh, which uh, were more comfortable on land, huh? moving on land with the use of the powerful forearms for hauling itself out of land. And so uh, you see Greenland and Nyafo, uh, which is now known as Tonga, uh, are uh, countries which have issued these uh, uh, stamps of fossil um, amphibians, early amphibians. As I mentioned, uh, for a long time, the link between uh, water um, dwelling fish and the land dwelling early amphibians wasn't known until around 10 or 15 years ago, this very, very unusual uh, amphibian was found in, in uh, the Arctic portion of Canada. It's called, very strangely, it's a native uh, uh, Canadian name, uh, Tiktaalik, uh, was um, discovered and it had fully functional um, limbs of the forearm, uh, which uh, gives people um, a very good idea, paleontologists, a very good idea how these animals may have dragged themselves out of uh, water and started moving on land. Of course, uh, I have no stamp to depict, but I, I do have one uh, issued recently. But what I also have is this very interesting coin a 20 cent coin from Canada, and it's a glow in the dark coin. If you take it to a dark room, the skeleton is visible. And in a lighted environment, you can see the whole animal. It's a colored coin, a very, very attractive coin from 2014. Several other um, early amphibians and what's sometimes called amphibio reptiles, huh? some uh, maybe at the uh, uh, very, very close to 
where uh, the ancestor of reptiles uh, were presumably have been uh, depicted on stamps and these are a bunch of them represented here um, there are many more vietnam um, benin in uh, uh, in africa and australia have uh, these um, early uh, amphibians unlike uh, many other uh, major groups of uh, vertebrates the early amphibians were much larger than present day amphibians like uh, Areops probably looked and was the sh shape of a, um, at least a small hippopotamus huh? or at least a gigantic pig. So these must have been uh, terif terrifying predators for um, other um, small uh, animals in water or at the edge of water or uh, on, on, on land. The first recognizable amphibians have also been depicted on stamps of the world. East uh, Germany was the first one from 1978 that showed um, uh, Paleobatricus diluvianus from Oligocene. So that's uh, 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 closer to our time, about 30 million years before present. And there's been some articles on this as well, the stamp as well as, of course, the fossil turtle. But Libya has a, a very interesting unnamed fossil, huh? uh, which after some research I found, it matches uh, Xenopus. Um, uh, Hasa, Hasaunus, I hope I had the pronunciation right. And uh, Xenopus, of course, is uh, a group of African frogs that are used, uh, that were used till recently in pregnancy testing uh, worldwide until more modern methods were found. So this uh, fossil species was in a Libyan uh, stamp. And most uh, more recently was um, this issue from Hungary, of late Cretaceous, huh? uh, of uh, uh, endemic uh, East European um, amphibian. All these uh, have uh, all the features of modern amphibians or modern frogs. Huh? So uh, this is um, what I'm, I'll tell you about uh, fossil. There are much more, but uh, it's uh, my story is very very synoptic. So, as I mentioned, a very rich group of, uh, of vertebrates, uh, amphibians. You see these figures here. Uh, and urines are frogs and toads. And there are uh, about seven and a half thousand frogs and toads around the world huh? every year. About 200 different species, uh, 200 uh, distinct species are being described. Caudata are salamanders. These are lizard-like um, amphibians. You see uh, as uh, the one from San Marino is um, Spelliomantis uh, italicus. It's a salamander from Italy, a cave salamander. And the least known a uh, group of uh, amphibians are Sicilians, Gymnophiona, uh, over 220 species. But Gymnophiona is very poorly known. Even herpetologists who study amphibians or reptiles, many of them have never seen a uh, Sicilian and uh, not surprisingly very poorly represented. I have a few uh, stamps depicting Sicilians. And the first one um, is this one from Central Africa showing uh, within a sheet of many species, one species, but uh, strangely, uh, this species doesn't belong to Central Africa. It's a Mexican species, Dermophis mexicanus. But um, the most common uh, um, uh, amphibian to be depicted on uh, a stamp, uh, stamps of the world are of course amphibians. And uh, here's uh, Vanuatu's beautiful uh, miniature sheet that shows two stamps of, uh, and the edges are die cut. You have a beautiful selvage uh, frog on top and the two stamps and they're so beautiful that I bet most people who buy them wouldn't want to use them for mailing. Huh? They would like to keep them to, uh, in their uh, stock book or would like me sometimes they would mail it to themselves huh, to have a postally used uh, amphibian. Oh, sorry, uh, I jumped. 
Um, let's talk about one of the important aspects of natural history. How, what happens? How do uh, frogs multiply? Uh, like all other animals, they reproduce, but um, reproduction is mostly external in amphibians. And uh, before that, there is a period of courtship whereby, in case of frogs, they make calls. Normally, it's the male frogs that call, and they have specialized structures on the throat called vocal sacs of different shapes and sizes. Some vocal sacs are bi uh, as big as the body, huh? and uh, they produce distinctive calls. Apparently, the females are attracted uh, and they choose the um, the male with the best uh, call. Some in some species, it's the females that call, and the males are um, choosing the females based on the calls. So some uh, representatives of amphibians on the left, Sierra Leone, a miniature sheet. The stamp shows the African bullfrog, but uh, the selvage, the undenominated portion of the stamp, shows a hyperoleus, a reed frog, a beautiful reed frog, uh, which is calling. The vocal sac is distended. And Ivory Coast, uh, again, show, uh, has another uh, frog. Um, uh, this is the common uh, frog of Africa, uh, which was uh, Bufo regularis, is now Amitophryni regularis. Um, again, uh, presumably males that are calling. So apart from uh, calling in frogs, there are other kinds of courtship. Uh, for instance, Solomandus live in water, and of course, calling would be a challenge. And here they court by dancing, uh, specific kinds of dance, which uh, help females not just choose the best dancer, but also choose the right species, because in that environment, there could be several salamanders. So to avoid breeding with the wrong species or trying to breed with the wrong species, um, they choose very carefully the species with the correct dance steps. Uh, and here uh, Laos has a stamp uh, of a miniature sheet of a common European uh, salamander or newt uh, doing their courtship dance. What follows is amplexus, which is not the same as mating. So here the male grabs the female and um, takes uh, directs her to uh, appropriate breeding place where the female would deposit the eggs and the males would fertilize it externally. Huh? So amplexus and fertilization of eggs, quite uh, different from what uh, is seen in um, other tetrapods like uh, other uh, higher vertebrates like uh, birds and uh, mammals or uh, reptiles. So the process uh, is called amplexus. The male uh, can grab the female by the armpit or by the waist. Huh? Here it's by the uh, armpit. What happens after a few days? The eggs start uh, getting, um, getting fertilized and get developing into tadpoles. And uh, strangely, very few countries have produced um, stems which show eggs of uh, of amphibians and here is a privately issued miniature uh, miniature sheet from Netherlands which uh, I think is uh, promoting the work of a local nature photographer Victor Boss I, I, I googled him and uh, he seems to be an expert on micro photography and this is from the early 2000s, of course, being privately issued, there's no catalog number or um, date of issue is unknown, but around year 2000. And one of them uh, is of uh, clearly of uh, developing uh, eggs of toads, uh, which are laid in strings. And of course, other stamps show uh, strands of human hair or uh, I think water strider. So um, there are some other, uh, not a great deal, but some um, uh, stamps have been issued on tadpoles. 
the next uh, stage in the life of an amphibian. This one I like, it's uh, the, the one on top is from uh, Pe People's Republic of China, which uh, tells children it's kind of a learning tool to let children know uh, how to associate uh, baby animals with the parents. So the story is, who's my mother or something like this, but the tadpoles hatch from the egg, uh, is unsure who the mother is, asks the shrimp, are you my mother? I said, no. The fish, are you my mother? No. The crab also says no. The turtle also says no. And finally, the tadpoles find the mother and goes, uh, and goes to the mother. Um, so this is uh, one of the few uh, long stories mm -hmm. featuring tadpoles. But I also found in the year 1980, uh, a painting by a, fa a famous uh, Chinese painter showing a rocky brook, uh, mountain brook. And there are some clear tadpoles uh, in that painting. Of course, in this case, tadpoles are only uh, tertiary or secondary or tertiary uh, in importance. It's not really about amphibians. It's about the story of um, a landscape. Malaysia has um, both a rich biodiversity and depiction of biodiversity on stamps and has produced uh, a large number of amphibians and stamps. And this one I like because it shows um, there's some tadpoles in the selvage uh, and a, even a metamorph, the stage between a tadpole and an adult, and uh, the figure at the bottom outside of the main stamp, and uh, two additional species of uh, stamps, including the famous uh, Wallace's flying frog here, and another very uh, rare species now, um, uh, Palkrana latrimaculata being the current name uh, is uh, depicted on the stamp and the others are on the selvage. So uh, in this case, I'd like to draw attention. Artists are getting more skillful over time and they would not only depict species, but also the environment where they're found. So you see uh, the background diorama uh, type would show habitat. So it's a kind of uh, also a useful device for learning and teaching, telling um, observant uh, philatelists what kind of environment these animals need. Another very interesting aspect of the life history of some amphibians is parental care. Many amphibians uh, just produce the eggs and go away. Uh, they don't look after their um, eggs or developing young. But not in this case, uh, Oreophryne, a species in New Guinea, depicted in the stamp from 2009, uh, shows a, a frog, mother, presumably, with the eggs that she's guarding. And in fact, I know the photographer, uh, uh, Steve uh, Richards, and uh, some others who have done research on this species. This is, to this day, an uh, undescribed species and uh, needs a name. Of course, someone will uh, eventually name it. So it is possible that um, a lot of uh, species actually depicted on stamps are actually unknown species or uh, require um, scientific naming. There are some other uh, unusual amphibians apart from parental care uh, uh, shown, uh, discussed just now. Uh, Darwin's frog, for instance, would uh, produce eggs and then the parent would swallow the eggs and let them develop in the, inside the body of the parent. And when the young ones um, transform from uh, these eggs, they would be, um, emerging from the parent and they would become little frogs. So Darwin's frog in a miniature sheet from Sierra Leone uh, in Africa, uh, but this frog is uh, not found there. So uh, here's a, just a random collection of uh, amphibians from all over the world to show you the great uh, diversity of amphibians. Um, there is glass frogs in uh, South America, 
the skin lack pigmentation. So you can actually see every bone and every organ without dissecting it. And the um, horn frogs of South America, they're so fierce that even though they are about two inch um, in, in length, they would attack your finger. They would kind of, if they could, they would try to swallow your finger. Or uh, the common uh, pond frogs here, Hylorana erythrea, the common European frog, uh, Rana temporaria. And here's an Indian example, Rachophorus sudumara baricus, and Lewix uh, salus romeri from Hong Kong. This is a frog that once threatened um, the current location of the Hong Kong airport. Uh, and finally, all the frogs that were found in that particular island were collected and uh, translocated successfully into another island. So you have the modern Hong Kong airport. So uh, here uh, again, uh, I depict some paintings, famous paintings here by a famous Japanese uh, painter Ito Jakuchu uh, from 1716 to 1800. He was alive and his paintings from Guyana, but he shows a bunch of frogs. But uh, any of you can tell me what's the collective noun for frogs? What do you call a group of frogs? Anyone? Without Googling, nobody? Okay, I'll give you the answer. Um, collective noun for frogs is, you'll be surprised to know, an army, an army of frogs. So here you do see an, uh, a collection of frogs there. So we have spoken about frogs. Let's look at some other groups. Huh? What is the second most um, common uh, group or, or the greatest diversity apart from frogs and toads are salamanders. And here are some representative species, um, including Proteus anguinus. This is a blind cave salamander found in Eastern Europe. You have to go several uh, hundred meters under the ground to see this. And because it never sees uh, daylight, it has no use for eyes. And in fact, the body has no pigmentation. So very, very curious uh, species. And there are other cave salamanders elsewhere, including uh, the um, neotenic version of uh, this ambistoma which uh, stays underground uh, in Mexico, which is called axolotl, which is a Mexican name for a, a god. And of course, the population that lives uh, on the surface have a regular pigmentation, but those that live uh, underground are pale. But the commonest one, I will discuss this again, is the common uh, fire salamander. And of course, this is a very, uh, has great uh, cultural significance in Europe. You know, it's associated with fire and an animal that cannot be destroyed by fire and uh, is also the symbol of sulfur and has been uh, depicted in many countries of the world. And the final uh, species I'd like to talk about is Bolitoglossus. Uh, uh, genus of uh, arboreal tree climbing salamanders. What's interesting is um, that it's so arboreal that it uses its feet as suckers and to stick to these uh, waxy leaves. And it has uh, not very differentiated fingers and toes. Huh? They are pad-like, huh? allowing uh, a life on trees. So you see so many different adaptations uh, in this just for example, cave dwellers, surface dwellers, uh, aquatic species, and arboreal species, uh, species that stay on trees. Um, I, I promised to talk also on predation, and here are some examples from Sierra Leone uh, in Africa, uh, showing predation by amphibians, Amphibians feed on a great diversity of animals. Only a few species are herbivorous. There's one in India 
Euphlictus hexadactylus, the common green frog, which feeds on leaves, and one in Brazil um, that feeds on fruits, huh? Hyla truncata. But most of the world's um, 8,000 uh, amphibians, uh, or at least frogs and toads, are as adults, uh, carnivores, huh? they would feed on insects, most of them arthropods, uh, arthropod feeders, but some of them are um, large enough to feed on small vertebrates huh? like mice. Some of them feed on small um, lizards, etc. And of course, uh, this, this is rather fanciful, a uh, frog jumping out of the water to grab a butterfly, but certainly if it's a perched butterfly, it would have a go at it. So one of the curious things about Philatelli is you're really looking for stamps within your theme, and I am no exception. So I would look very carefully at uh, stamps, looking for amphibians, and some of them is quite a challenge, especially as you get older, your eyesight's not as great. So when you look at the scenery of carnivorous plants, suddenly you see there is a snake eating a frog, but this is quite clear. But sometimes you have to look very, very closely at a, a stamp to see where's the frog here or here. And uh, sometimes uh, we do see uh, predation on amphibians. Amphibians are also food for a lot of animals huh? from fish, to um, birds, to mammals, but also in invertebrates. So many uh, insects feed on frog eggs or even adults of frogs. And this is a very curious observation made by a photographer. And finally, we wrote an article on this. If you wish, you can read it in herpetology notes of a possible um, nuptial gift of a frog offered by a male uh, Raffles's Malkoha, a bird in, in Brunei to a female um, uh, for courtship, uh, during courtship. And after writing this article, um, I found a stamp that shows a roller uh, doing the same thing, offering uh, a mate, uh, uh, another kind of frog, maybe a Wallace's tree frog, not very sure. Um, so, uh, frogs are important both as uh, prey in the natural world as well as predators. As I mentioned, um, amphibians have in both inspired humans uh, or have served as um, objects for scientific research. So here are just some examples. So electricity itself was discovered. Uh, through uh, research on frogs when Galvani found uh, legs to twitch, um, uh, severed legs of frogs in an experiment. And also Volta used um, amphibians for his research. And even in ancient China, uh, amphibians uh, have been used in uh, scientific research as shown by this uh, set from Hong Kong which uh, has um, a, an equipment made by the ancient Chinese. It's an earthquake um, predicting machine, which is depicted on the right-hand side. So a mild tremor, which is not felt by humans or perceived by humans, would drop these balls, um, metal balls from the machine and into the mouth of these frogs or toads at the bottom of the machine. So this uh, would give them advance notice of an earthquake to come. Huh? It's one of the famous uh, um, inventions, uh, of one of the first seismoscope perhaps um, made by humans. Even uh, the human genome project uh, dependent, uh, depended um, on uh, living resources, including all these animals and especially frogs. And in this issue from Great Britain uh, is a frog there in, in the form of a scientist using a lab coat and talking to a crocodile. 
And there's some other uh, examples here. Um, you would find John Gordon, who's a um, Nobel laureate, who also worked on amphibians. And Palau has a stamp, a miniature sheet on the Human Genome Project. And here are some amphibians on a 33 cent uh, stamp. So uh, uh, apart from science, um, amphibians also feature in human uh, culture, uh, folklore, religion uh, as a very powerful symbol. So I just have some images here, Zimbabwe, a wooden carving, Paraguay, a print of a frog, but perhaps more interesting is uh, this image from Japan, uh, the stamp showing uh, one of the early calligraphers, Hokusai, who uh, was dissolution in life and seeing life go nowhere and challenges that he couldn't um, overcome till he saw a frog in a pond and trying to jump onto some leaves. The frog tried and tried and tried many times till he finally succeeded. And finally, uh, the truth dawned on him that he must try harder and be more persistent, and which he did. And as a result, he became the most famous calligrapher in China, in Japan. So uh, this is depicted the frog Hokusai and his um, the plants uh, over water that inspired him. So um, sometimes uh, we tell stories to children, but this is a form of uh, telling them how to con conform to societal rules. We just keep on saying, don't do this. They may not listen to us, but if you put this advice within a story, um, it may be more successful. So uh, this uh, is a useful device used worldwide, but uh, here depicted in uh, four uh, folk tales from Taiwan, Republic of China uh, in 1998. This is a little folder and uh, there's a story of a frog in a well and there are other stories for each of these different animals. So in general, frogs and um, other amphibians have had a good um, reputation uh, with humans and very often you see on the left uh, the, the princess and the frog story uh, which is uh, universally uh, understood and appreciated but occasionally there is a dark side and sometimes for instance in uh, western nations like uh, uh, in the past in US and in uh, western Europe um, amphibians especially toads were associated with witches and even the presence of a toad was indicative of witchcraft and was punishable by death. So um, this uh, set uh, two, two issues from Sweden of Nordic uh, mythology uh, show um, all the unpleasant animals in their view that were associated with witches and witchcraft, black magic and such um, um, negative uh, aspects uh, of uh, the society at that time. So you can see uh, frogs raining from the sky there or a little toad sitting next to bats and ravens and um, other um, animals that were associated with um, evil. But uh, as we, as education spreads, as we get more informed about the value of uh, nature, of uh, biodiversity, progressively amphibians have become a uh, motive or a symbol of conservation and uh, especially of the environments that they're associated with. So in, in this uh, slide, I show you some amphibians um, associated with protection of um, water, huh? uh, freshwater lakes in the UK, or the International Year of Freshwater um, uh, issued by Guyana. So uh, here, 
the association brings uh, to uh, um, the knowledge of uh, people that um, how amphibians are associated with wetlands and why uh, and uh, therefore important uh, for conservation. U.S. still recently had not issued any many stamps on amphibians, so they remedied this in 2019 by issuing a series of uh, four uh, amphibian stamps, and these are here uh, in this panel. They are reproduced uh, twice in the same panel, the other four designs, and I'm also showing you the um, uh, the first day of issue dedication ceremony, it was a special event in uh, Idaho where um, the stamps were issued. And this is the invitation uh, letter to uh, folks to come. So uh, when stamps are released, very often there's an occasion, a uh, special big occasion for philatelists and conservationists. And in this uh, uh, is the release uh, in this slide. I showed four or uh, I think four or six stamps were released by Vietnam in 2014. Um, and I have uh, the brochure signed by the artist who designed these stamps. Uh, uh, these were tree frogs, huh? Vietnam's tree frogs. Some of the most beautiful frogs uh, on stamps were found, uh, can be found in uh, from issues from Ecuador in South America. And this is uh, three booklet paints from Ecuador showing uh, quite a lot of frogs. With, uh, you can see the scientific names. Um, the place uh, is called Crystal, uh, probably a nature reserve, and Rana's uh, frogs of Crystal. Malaysia has, uh, I mentioned, uh, several uh, philatelic issues where frog is the primary theme or secondary theme. And here are some examples. Uh, on the left is the folder showing some species. And uh, on the right, the three frogs. The one at the bottom is a famous uh, bony and horn frog, which um, is iconic, almost um, synonymous with uh, the frogs of Borneo. And also um, issued was this sheet more recently, 2016, um, Seven Wonders of Malaysia. And this, I'm so happy that one of the wonders uh, perceived by the postal department is a frog. Um, but of course, there are also in other interesting animals like turtles and fish and uh, um pheasant and uh, mouse deer and bees. Uh, but uh, the frog, uh, unfortunately, it's a common one, but still it's good to have an amphibian representative. These are self-adhesive stamps. You rip them out of the sheet, uh, uh, peel them and stick them. And when you scan the QR code, you can learn more about the life history of the particular species. This was produced um, in collaboration with the Zoology Department of University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. So um, amphibians, beautiful amphibian stamps have also been issued by um, Australia. And uh, here are some examples of, um, of uh, recent examples from Australia. 2018 on the left is a folder. Um, on the top right is a perforate version, and the bottom is the imperforate version of the same miniature sheet showing uh, for a species of stamps. And the same stamps were also issued uh, on their own in, in this format, each one in a different miniature sheet that came out of the folder. So um, other interesting and colorful representations uh, include this uh, sheetlet and four value stamps from Zimbabwe showing frogs in their habitats. So basically the same designs were also in the miniature sheet and in the uh, four value stamps. 
And uh, here we have a presentation pack of stamps, which um, are convenient ways in which you can learn about the frogs and have the stamps inside them and learn about all the technical specifications uh, behind the printing of the stamps. This is from the Frogs of uh, Malaysia series of 2017. Taiwan also issued a set. This is from 1988. What I am showing is from my collection is a album page that the post office issued has again in Chinese and English text and describes very briefly the amphibian depicted and some technical details, um, printing technique and how many stamps were produced per sheet and so on. New Guinea and Belarus, um, again, miniature sheets, you see beautiful stamps um, of amphibians. And uh, if I were to give a prize to a country for its amphibian stamps, uh, there were two winners probably, Ecuador and Colombia, which have both beautiful frogs and beautiful stamps. Here you have a presentation pack from Colombia that uh, feature, of course, uh, some frogs on the cover, a miniature sheet, and a cancellation that also shows an amphibian. And this is. Um, from 2002, uh, the text in Spanish. This uh, sheet list was produced uh, to promote uh, maybe conservation of uh, ponds and wetlands of Australia. And uh, most of the species uh, prominently depicted are amphibians. There's also kingfisher and uh, dragonfly but there are four amphibians. So I would, see, uh, I would say this is primarily a amphibian stamp. And again, uh, it reinforces the association between uh, water and frogs. Uh, protect, you wanna protect frogs, you have to protect wetlands. You protect wetlands and water bodies, you will protect frogs. So uh, you see um, how Postal authorities are getting concerned and are communicating these messages to the public of conservation and through an innovative way by depicting not just species, but also habitats. This one from Uruguay and uh, South America 2015 shows a landscape of um, wetland and all the species that are found in wetlands, and you would also see a frog there. But there's also snakes, and there are crabs, birds, uh, capybara, and many other species. So in this uh, landscape, amphibians are also very, very significant. There's been uh, so a lot of research on uh, what are the kinds of uh, species depicted on stamps. And uh, one of these uh, I'd like to show you, this is by Nemesio et al in 2013. Um, he showed that uh, amongst uh, animals, caudates, that is the more, uh, the, the vertebrate bearing animals are overrepresented compared to invertebrates. And within uh, chordates, birds and uh, mammals are overrepresented, and amphibians are grossly underrepresented, and fish and reptiles are also underrepresented in terms of the species richness. In fact, if you look closer, uh, within um, mammals, you have more uh, stamps of horses and elephants than other groups. And rodents, some of the smaller ones, or bats are uh, underrepresented. Huh? So uh, this shows that in the past, um, people emphasized animals probably that they knew best. And because uh, frogs are smaller than uh, many other animals, they, they were underrepresented. But this 
is now seems to be being remedied and now many um, countries as I, as i mentioned have issued amphibian stamps and maybe this trend will go on so uh, not just uh, as a major theme but frogs also appear in surprising places you have to really examine stamps to find the frogs for instance there's a, a um, stamp on folklore from Zimbabwe that talks why the hippo lost its hair. It was caught in a fire. And you go with a magnifying glass and look at what's illustrated. And there you are. There's a frog there, also escaping the uh, flames. Uh, or look very closely at some um, um, stamps on fashion in Romania. And looking closely at this woman's dress, I see a frog. So it's a matter of finding the frog in many stamps that are not listed as um, pertaining to amphibians. Or um, look at this uh, image of, uh, from Finland. You have to look very closely. Where is the frog? The frog is here, upside down, in a book being read by children. So there you are, upside down. You can see the, uh, the image of the frog. It's a common toad from an issue um, from Finland in 2010. And uh, my own uh, experience is I got this um, letter from a dealer. I bought some stamps from. And uh, I'm always looking at the beak of birds. And I, I was disappointed. There was nothing there, nothing here. And suddenly, I thought there's a frog here. So I looked very closely, and indeed, there was a frog. And suddenly, uh, it became something that I was interested in. So I wrote to him and ordered the stamp showing the frog in the bill. This was in 2020. It still doesn't have a Stanley Gibbons uh, catalog number. So I'll talk about exceptional stamps. Um, there's a series of uh, personalized stamps and I do have the set, uh, nothing to do with amphibians, but suddenly one of uh, two of them have amphibians on them and I took photos of them. You can't scan the stamps because they have embedded gemstone. Huh? For instance, the red-eyed tree frog has a Chromium diopside uh, gemstone stuck to it. So I had to photograph it with a tripod and uh, Salamander uh, has a yellow jasper stuck to it. So beautiful stamps these are. Um, the value is written here, but uh, the selling price is over the face value. So these are some of the most incredible stamps, I think, uh, to highlight uh, in some of my most favorite uh, stamps, if you ask me. There are also the question, which is the smallest and largest stamp. The smallest is this from Colombia in 1979, 18 by 20 millimeters, and shows a stylized frog, like it's from a set on uh, the gold of the uh, ancient people of Colombia. The largest is from Mozambique, from Africa. It's a, uh, not a miniature sheet, but just a giant stamp. 81 by 91 uh, millimeters uh, in length and into width. The first and most recent stamp. The first amphibian stamp, again, it's a stalk uh, to examine the bill. And I saw amphibian, uh, a frog in the bill. And it's from an uh, area called Bergedorf, now part of Germany. Uh, but that time was a uh, country of its own, issuing its own stamps. And I'm very proud to have both the perf and imperf versions of the stamp. Um, and the most recent, not out yet, but I keep very close watch on what's coming out. On the 19th of May, the US will be issuing this um, set of stamps, uh, including the Wyoming toad. It's one of the forever stamps and which means um, it can be used for local post forever. And uh, yeah, I look forward to adding this to my uh, philatelic zoo. So which is the most commonly portrayed frog in a stamp? 
So the most commonly portrayed uh, frog is the red-eyed tree frog, which is from Costa Rica, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Colombia. But all kinds of countries in almost every continent have issued um, stamps showing this uh, species on, on their stamp, uh, although it doesn't occur there. And Colombia, of course, is wise not to use it, although this species occurs there. It's such a common species that they didn't use it uh, wisely. Yeah, so it's a beautiful frog, but um, overused. 34 countries and over 60 stamps of this species appears uh, are unknown till now. The most commonly portrayed salamander is the... Um, Tiger salamander uh, or salamandra salamandra, the common salamander, issued by 25 countries uh, or postal authorities and 34 stamps. Again, it has been issued by countries where this species does not occur, right? like the Central African Republic, Congo, um, Djibouti in Africa, uh, Kuril, Laos, uh, and uh, Somalia. So uh, these countries presumably wanted a very colorful amphibian, and they, and they chose this uh, salamander. So what about India? Um, how many amphibians have been issued? Not many. The first one is from 1991. Uh, it's a satanant pair uh, showing a stylized frog. Uh, species cannot be recognized. And uh, it's part of a greeting stamp, but I'm surprised how valuable this set has become. Um, but closer to our time, 20, 2012, my colleague, uh, Karthik Vasudevan, who used to work with the Wildlife Institute, who had described the species, um, Rakaforus pseudomalabaricus, worked with the postal department to issue the stamp and the miniature sheet. They are different because this came from um, big sheets um, of 20 or so. And the miniature sheet has other endemic species of the four biodiversity hotspots of India. Uh, most, most recently in 2015 was this uh, issue on Children's Day, uh, which has a little stylized frog there. So that's about all for amphibians of India. And I really hope the postal authorities would take note and issue more uh, biodiversity stamps, uh, which would make um, people um, interested in amphibians. So with this, I end uh, my lecture. I thank my institute and my university, and also the societies I'm part of, uh, PSKS, Philatelic Society of Kuching Sarawak, uh, Philatelic Society of Malaysia, um, the Ecuador Club I'm a member of because they have such interesting frog stamps and other biodiversity stamps and the American uh, Topical Society. And also I'd like to tell you about this interesting miniature sheet from Jersey 2017 uh, commemorating two great naturalists um, Gerald Darrell and Charles Darwin. This uh, miniature sheet was printed on wood, huh? in, on wood which has been certified by the Forestry Stewardship Council, FSC, and also uh, highlighting the importance of conservation and sustainable um, plantations. So that's me. I started collecting stamps from the age of eight. Uh, from uh, school going age, I would collect stamps and collect tadpoles and grow them. Um, and then couldn't understand why they didn't survive in the bottles that I kept them. Didn't know metamorphosis happening and dietary requirements were different. But some of my uh, collections, therefore, are about 50 years old. And uh, persistence uh, helps. Uh, so in 2018, I had. At that time, every amphibian stamp issued 1644. Now it's about 2,000 plus amphibian stamps issued. Uh, no more to collect. So, um, yeah. With this, I thank you. And my email here, if you want to contact me for any philatelic or amphibian-related queries, 
We are also host of the 10th World Congress of Herpetology here in uh, Sarawak, Kuching in August. If you are uh, doing research on amphibians, please attend. You'll get further information on our website uh, when it's uh, online uh, very soon, I think by next month. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vas. It was really a wonderful presentation. And uh, as we always tell that every stamp has a story, but the way you spoke, it was just storytelling like thing only. So it Thank was really you. wonderful to hear you. Uh, any questions? Sir, chat box comments ahead. Uh, Gita Iyer, she has said, seeing a stamp on evolution for the first time, interesting depiction, rich collection and enriched with scientific information. Well presented, sir. Thanks. Hi, Dr. Das. Uh, in your opinion, how effective are the stamps on wildlife in interesting curiosity of the general to learn about nature? So I think Professor Das will be able to tell about this question. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, how effective is con uh, uh, is amphibians as a tool uh, for conservation? I think very important, had been very important uh, before the advent of internet, because um, as most of us who are over 40 or over 50 years old would know that color images were very rare during our time. And very often, uh, newspapers were black and white, textbooks were black and white, there was no internet. So the only colorful uh, image that came to us was postage stamps from within the country and from outside. So many of us as young kids were collecting stamps and wondering at the beauty of, of these things. And very often, our first uh, in encounter with wildlife was with postage stamps. So uh, I think uh, although there are more um, distractions now, but postage stamps still have a role to play in highlighting the importance of the environment and in making people aware of the beauty of stamps. After all, stamps are supposed to be cheap and widely available and uh, potentially available for young people to encounter on an envelope. Um, and therefore, the curious amongst them would be encouraged to uh, learn more about um, that uh, species or that ecosystem. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, any other question? I think now I request Savarkar sir, to uh, say a few words because uh, I, I think probably everyone must be knowing Professor Savarkar. He was a director for Central Wildlife Institute, Dehradun. Uh, so I request Savarkar, sir. So uh, one thank, you very, thank you very much. Uh, all that I can say is that this has been a wonderful experience. Uh, and uh, as Professor Vatak said, it, it came, uh, you know, to capture attention of everyone as a story. And uh, some beautiful pictures there. It take me back, as I said earlier on, uh, uh, we were young people in 1994. Uh, and uh, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Das. And, uh, well, I didn't know at the time that... Uh, he was such a great philatelist. This has been a pure pleasure. And I think Philly can do a great deal in uh, furthering the cause of conservation, as we can see with this particular uh, species that were uh, highlighted today. Many people are not aware of them, but uh, this, is, this is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Thank you sir.
Dr. Savarkar inspired me. Uh, I did, haven't told you, Dr. Savarkar, to collect chili on stamps, but I could only collect about 10 of them. <laughs> I'm sure there are many more <laughs> because Dr. Savarkar loves to uh, raise uh, chili. What's the right um, expression, uh, Dr. Savarkar? You grow. Uh, now I request Ramani, sir. He, Ramani, sir, is a very renowned philatelist. So we have got some very eminent philatelists with us. Ramani, sir, is there. Ramu, sir, is also there. And then I will request uh, 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 I think what is what sir uh, uh, Ramani sir. Thank you, Dr. Das, for this wonderful presentation. I, I really enjoyed every slide that you presented. Uh, I, I think there are a few points which which I thought you know, are are very, very nice. And then for people who are looking at philately as well as uh, you know nature on stamps. There are a few things which, which, you, which you pointed out which are very nice. One of them was that how you have to so closely follow or look at the stamp to try and find out the point of your interest on the stamp. This was something which was uh, wonderful. And I, and, I, and I thought that some of the stamps that you showed me uh, really, really showed that is, that is the kind of uh, you know, keenness with which you observe the stamp. Uh, to find out if there is a frog on the stamp or, or an amphibian on the stamp. That is, that is, I think, something fantastic. And in the process, when I looked at uh, some of the stamps that you showed, uh, I am a collector of stamps on insects. So I, 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 I did see that quite a few of the stamps that I managed to get uh, with insects on them also you know, are, are part of this amphibian collection that you have got. And quite a few of them uh, I managed. But then, of course, I have also missed out a few uh, which which you have shown where I have, I'm seeing insects on the stamps, you know, like 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 the ones some of them which which didn't have the frogs but did have some insects on on the stamps. Other, the other thing that uh, I also liked about your lecture was the data that you presented. The data that you presented is also very very uh, interesting to try and tell how many countries have produced stamps and how many you know countries have produced uh, stamps uh, where the stamp the the frog itself is not there in that particular country but they have produced the stamp about that particular frog or about that particular amphibian. And also uh, the fact that, you know, some of these uh, stamps are so beautiful, as you rightly pointed out. And I, I, I can also see that some of them are so beautiful, so colorful, so nice, that uh, even though the, the, the frog is not there in their country, they, I mean, you know, they thought it wise to put it, put it on the stamp, which, which goes to show the kind of interest several of these countries have got on, I mean, putting wildlife on, on the stamps. So that, you know, not only it, it, is, it is a question of awareness, it is also the question of the beauty of the wildlife which, 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 which they have or which other countries have got. So I think those, those are very good uh, points that you made. Uh, one sm small uh, request to, uh, to you is that, uh, to me, it looked like the way from the, from the presentation, uh, it's the South America as well as Africa, which have produced more stamps on frogs. Is that, is that right? Uh, it looks like, um, yeah. Uh, it was especially South Americans seem very proud of their amphibians. Of course, Europe has a very poor fauna, but Asian countries, uh, no, we haven't done well. If you look at, for example, insects, it's the African continent, which has produced the most number of stamps on insects. Uh, not 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 the not Europe or any other uh, um, or the Americas or Asia. It is the African continent that has produced more insects, and looks like it is true even for uh, amphibians. That's what that's what that's what I presume from the data that you presented. You know the list of countries that that you that you that you showed. Thank you. Yeah, another one one other point which which I thought was also very nice was your representation of you know the kind of biodiversity that is seen amongst the different groups of uh, animals and the representation of stamps, which I think is also a very, very uh, valid point where, you know, the, the more, I mean, uh, I would say the more beautiful and, you know, more popular uh, species, uh, which like, for example, horses, elephants or butterflies or, or things of that kind are more on stamps, even though they, they over-represent the biodiversity, even though it, it is over-representing the biodiversity, but they seem to be uh, more on stamps rather than uh, some of these uh, main uh, animals which are not so attractive to look at or which are not admired by people are underrepresented, even though the diversity is very high. That, I think, is a, is a very, very good uh, point that you made. Thank you. Ramu, sir, you have anything? Uh, 
to say? Yes, sir. Ek minute, sir. Rajshikar, sir. Ek do minute. Just uh, Ramu, sir. Because I think Dr. Uh, Ramu has also got a very wonderful collection of amphibians on stamp. And he's also one of the renowned philatelists of our country. Ramu, sir. I think he is. <laughs> okay, sir, Rashika, sir, please. Sir, I am Rashika for everyone, all of you for the August gathering. Just I would like to show the lotus, uh, lotus stamps, a uh, lotus uh, maximum card, and the French um, stylish lotus stamps issued by French India in 1944. So it is a uh, free French government issued stamps in uh, 1944 in Paris. So why I am depicting is, and I am requesting uh, all herpetologists like Indranil, sir, there is a lot of diversity on uh, frogs in Eastern Ghats. I am a researcher on Eastern Ghats ecology also. And Western Ghats are there. Why can't the stamps, the, the fillet list who collect uh, stamps on amphibians uh, represent like a true representation to government of India for the issue of stamps on the Western Ghat diversity and the Eastern Ghat diversity? And I missed the correcting as a specimen in Mizoram forest when I went for a normal impact assessment uh, in Mizoram in Gwalasip um, district of Mizoram, a tiny frog less than a uh, 5 mm diameter. Just it just it escaped before I could uh, I could correct the specimen because I also took the permissions from the wildlife warden. If any new species are there. Could we collect the specimen for science, then declare for for the designating its name? So I'm 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 requesting, as I said, like the I'll end the question, requesting the, for issue of stamps on Eastern Ghats mountainous ecosystem frogs and Western Ghats mountainous ecosystem frogs. Because especially in Western Ghats, in the forests of Vainad, Kerala, the, the pink frog uh, is rediscovered in mid-2000 uh, era by Dr. Biju of uh, Delhi University. Comments? Neil? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 Biju is my friend, and in fact, he named a frog after me. So anyway, um, the issue of uh, convincing uh, the postal authorities to issue a stamp um, is very complex and political. I was told uh, it's not easy. Uh, every year uh, they receive um, requests. And there's a lot of uh, pressure to issue stamps on prominent are not so prominent political leaders and uh, anniversaries. So um, it, it's not just India, but many other countries I know. So uh, one way is to every year, uh, all of some of us uh, form a group and every year we petition. So after some years, maybe they'll listen to us. Uh, Western Ghats, they have produced a couple of things recently, but Eastern Ghats, I, I agree. There has been nothing. And part of the reason is Eastern Ghats is extremely rich, but seems to be a poor cousin of Western Ghats in terms of perception of people. Because um, some of the higher reaches, I have done some work there. Uh, uh, some of the higher reaches are still uh, very poorly known. And uh, I, I think it's, it's good uh, if we can convince postal authorities to again, make us uh, more aware of the conservation importance of these uh, mountain range. So this is not a cover on amphibians, but this is a cover I got released on um, red sanders, Stereocarpus sandalinus, mm -hmm. issued by the First Lady of uh, Andhra Pradesh way back in 2003 by Haripriya Rangarajan Garu. Okay. And because the the cover I showed that the ecosystem in Talakona forests of Sheshachalam uh, ranges has an so unique diversity of um, amphibians, especially frogs. Maybe uh, your friends uh, uh, in high places would be in a better position. 
to help us lobby for <laughs> release <laughs> of such, uh, then um, uh, some of us are so deep into science and have uh, very little clout. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I think in earlier uh, earlier lectures we had uh, I think Ramu sir and Ramani sir specifically uh, given the information what is the problem as far as government of India is concerned regarding coming out of new stand. So a lot of discussion was there and as you suggested that is the point that every year we must again approach and approach and send our this thing suggestion that till, this thing should they, be depicted. Yeah, given. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, that is the. But uh, Neil, what, what do you think about the future of philately? Because you are collecting from the age of eight, so practically more than 50 years you are collecting. So what do you think about future of philately? Means very few people are uh, collecting now in India, or I think all over the world, but what do you think? Uh, okay, I'll give you my opinion and based on my experience, right? So um, in the past, I know uh, we grew up in India and in a class of maybe 50, most of the young boys collected stamps. Huh? Of course, we had no internet. We had uh, very few other uh, indoor uh, activities. Of course, outdoors, we were all very sporty and playing hockey and soccer and cricket. But indoors, yes. But now there are many uh, distractions. And at the same time, um, there is an uh, increase in the cost of stamps. So uh, before it was a few uh, pennies, uh, literally, huh? But now um, a set of stamps, a first day cover, these are quite serious investments if you want a complete collection for a young child. So the government of India has done some good uh, moves in this. They have stamp clubs. They have even scholarships for uh, um, young stamp club members, huh? uh, st uh, student scholarships, which I think very few countries have done that. Huh? So uh, in a way, they are also making sure people will always be interested in stamps. But now, slowly, people are moving from the enjoyment of uh, collecting to uh, investment grade stamps, of course. But I think philately will always survive. Uh, mind you, the human population is increasing. So when the, the total number of um, potential people uh, who would be interested in amphibians, thanks to your effort, of course, uh, would uh, also lead to an increase um, in interest. And they'll always be philately as a hobby and, of course, uh, as investment and appreciation. What, what we should do, philatelists, what they should do to promote this hobby? What um, type of activity we should carry out to? Yeah, to so join talks more like people. this. Yeah, talks like this. But also, a child's birthday, give him a stamp album. Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yes, yes. So that we will definitely do. And uh, this lecture by Professor Das will be available on our YouTube channel also. So those who are interested, they can watch or they can ask their friends also because many may not, they must be watching on YouTube also. So you can uh, send this recorded lecture to people, those who will be interested in philately or in the subject, I think that will be more interesting. Because as uh, the Professor Das has said that this will bring philatelists as well as uh, expert in amphibians also together. So that way we should look forward. Uh, any any more questions? Ramu sir, Ramu sir, I think still is Ramani sir. Okay, Ramu sir. I see a couple of questions in the okay. oh, chat box. Uh, I think you can you can just go. Okay, okay. Gita uh, Ayer, um, do you do similar presentation for school teachers? Um, I mean, I have spoken in schools here, but if there is interest, I'd be interested in uh, giving talks uh, on not just on amphibian philately, but um, we have done research on and published on conservation stamps and how uh, conservation stamps have been 
uh, uh, like new features have been used to highlight conservation issues. It was an article in STEM magazine, like thermal stamp. You touch the stamp, it gets brown or changes color to, emphasize, to um, emphasize climate change, or you touch the map and it shows all the world that we underwater and uh, so on. So yeah, if there is interest, I would be interested in interacting with teachers or students. Another question, Viper, uh, is uh, how vast is your collection now? Uh, okay, I, uh, I collect every kind of stamp. Uh, this is uh, amphibian, of course, uh, more than 2,000, but uh, my turtle stamp collection may be 5,000. <laughs> and uh, pangolins, of course, uh, Ajit and I wrote a book on pangolin stamps of the world uh, a few years ago. Um, then we collect unusual stamps, and in fact, uh, I don't know, maybe many hundred thousand stamps in the house. I had no idea because after 50 years, you lose count. My wife, fortunately, is a philatelist, so she has her own collection. She collects Malaysia. And I also have uh, Indian uh, uh, states and uh, India mint. I have um, an unusual uh, collection is big. Uh, fauna on stamp, Darwin on stamp, uh, Braille on stamps. So these are some areas I'm interested in. Uh, I have uh, some lot of shipment not yet opened. <laughs> yes, yes. On, on weekend. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you told me that they, that so huge means I think few rooms are full with stamps and related yes. material. Yeah, and Cinderellas, uh, Cinderellas yeah. promoting uh, conservation and tuberculosis. Uh, is another area I'm interested in. That would be a great problem for you when you come back to India to bring all the, the, your material. Any any more this thing? Anyone want to talk? Mr. Raj Sir, uh, the, the Das, sir, just I would like to add one point. Uh, see, as you, you are aware, as you collect Indian federatory states, the Bawalpur ba state has issued uh, stamps on wetland ecology. Oh, I wasn't aware. I mean, uh, when? Bawalpur, it is matched in, and now it is a part of Pakistan. But like yeah. In, uh, yeah. Earlier, it was in the erstwhile uh, uh, part of West India. So it issued stamps on pelicans and wetlands. Remotely, one stamp is related to the aquatic world. But I, I've not seen, I'm a keen philatelist on medicinal diversity, medicinal ecology on stamps. I collect stamps on wildlife, endangered species, and uh, uh, pertaining to the Hyderabad Federal Street. So, so then uh, I will keep, keep an eye for the any spare stamps which you know I might come across my collections okay. in so uh, that is for you sir just uh, sharing yeah. the topic I think, uh, yes shared his uh, professor das has shared his email id so you can uh, contact him accordingly hmm? any more to say ramani sir any more I, 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 I should really you know, thank Dr. Das for this really wonderful presentation. I think it was very, very, very I mean, you know, informative, not only in terms of learning about amphibians, but also the, the, the wide diversity. I'm sure this uh, stamp collection that he has showed us is, must be only maybe 10% or 20% of his real collection. Oh, That's no, what he must that, have shown not, us. Not that, 1% probably. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe. I mean, of, of amphibians only. I'm talking about only ah, the amphibians. Okay, 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 only okay, the okay. amphibians, I think. <laughs> so <laughs> that, 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 that itself shows the, you know, the kind of uh, this thing and uh, the kind of things that he showed about culture and the various uh, other aspects about, you know, how uh, and amphibians are perceived by different different cultures and uh, different people. You know, I, I I think this this is this was one of the best talks I've heard on uh, you know with nature and stamps. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Das. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ramani. So I think uh, we'll stop today. Thank you, for Professor Das, for uh, giving time for our uh, this thing. Or organization, okay. and I think we will look forward also because practically more than one year I am trying to get Professor Das on the, for this lecture, and he's so much busy. So, but finally, 
because of the frog day he could come probably i think that was the reason <laughs> otherwise he wouldn't come so sometimes next also we'd like to have some more lectures because, because it was a really wonderful uh, presentation and as ramani sir has told it was really just like a storytelling everyone must be enjoying and uh, thank you again uh, i think we, with this we'll close today's session